Good morning. Dimelang. Tani bonani. Kuya more. Lochani. Welcome everybody to this children and uh, COVID-19 advocacy briefs. Putting children first from response to recovery. My name is Tracy Naledi. I am the chairperson of the Gano Atlantic Fellows for Health Equity in South Africa and the Deputy Dean for Health Services um, at the Health, uh, Health Sciences Faculty at UCT. I really would like to start by acknowledging the moment we find ourselves in. With COVID, many of us have lost loved ones, have lost livelihoods. We've just witnessed the Zondo Commission with state looting. We've had public looting. We've had taxi violence. And the list goes on. I would really like to start by expressing mine and the Children's Institute and our partners solidarity with all of you out there and all of us that are going through the most at the moment. I would also like to celebrate the spirit of South Africans. And I think this moment has also highlighted just what it is that we can do when we come together and put our minds to it. COVID itself has seen community and civil society initiatives like the CANS and many other initiatives have seen collaborations across racial lines, across social class lines. And really as South Africans, many South Africans have actually said, even though we are hungry and suffering, we will not let that be the reason we loot our country and we will protect our democracy. I would like to acknowledge those that have gone before us who have sacrificed so much for us to have this democracy for us to protect. And I think we must all protect their legacy and not squander our inheritance and the future of our nation. And I think we've shown as South Africans that the majority of us are really interested in a positive journey that takes us to where our forefathers dreamt that we would be. Each generation has its own struggles and ours is for once and for all to address the issue of unemployment, poverty and inequality and ensure that we have a capable and an accountable state that places its people at the center of everything. We can only do that through partnerships and collaborations to ensure that we can translate evidence into policy, into practice, into advocacy, and ultimately into changing people's lives. The recent lootings, I think, have shown everyone who is willing to see that we can no longer tinker on the edges on, on the edges and on the margins. But what we need to do together is to transform the environments where we all live, where we grow up, where we work, where we play, to ensure that we allow every single citizen to fulfill their true potential. We must continue to protect what we have gained already, all the efforts that we have fought for, and continue to advocate for more investment in child rights, in child services, and ensure that we have improved access and improved quality. I would like to welcome the editor and the co-editors, the authors of the briefs, our esteemed speakers and panelists, and that I will introduce to you um, as they come up to speak. I'd like to welcome my co-facilitator, Mark Hayward, all of these people who will be speaking to you today are all friends of the Institute, fellow advocates for social justice. And I'd like to welcome all of you from all our diverse community of students, of researchers, of policymakers, civil society actors, mums and dads, young people, and all of us who are advocates for child rights. What is wonderful, what has been a gift of COVID is that I think we have been able to be more inclusive and have in some of these efforts like this launch a lot more people. 
but certainly we cannot see one another, but we would really appreciate to hear your voice. You will be able to ask questions and make suggestions on the chat. In the first half, we'll be able to hear our speakers and our editors and our, and our editor and our co-editor. In the second half, you'll be able to make suggestions um, uh, on how we can improve our response for, for children. And we encourage you to really have your voice heard in the chat. The authors of the briefs, we encourage you also to respond as you see fit on the questions that emerge on the chat. Um, we will respond to questions, but we don't have much time. But what we cannot respond to, we will respond in writing and post on the Children's Institute website. Time is tight, so we would like our speakers to please keep to time. And the session will be divided into two. The first part will be really be talking about the evidence. The second part will be a conversation that will be um, facilitated by, by Mark Haywood. Um, and uh, we would like to start with that and not waste any more time and welcome our first speaker, who is Dr. Yogan Pile, who is the country director for the Clinton Health Access Initiative of South Africa. Many of us know Dr. Pile very well, that he has till most recently been a senior manager within the Department of Health and has been the former director of the department, um, former deputy director general of health within the Department of Health, and has award has been awarded an honorary doctorate actually from the University of Cape Town more recently, but is known very much for his efforts of contributing to the health system and strengthening the health system, and has really been an exemplary leader in with regards to the development of the universal health care. So, Jürgen, over to you, and we'd like you to spend a few minutes just contextualizing this moment in the issue of equity. Over to you, Jürgen. Tracy, thanks very much for the introduction, and I would like to align myself completely with your sentiments. Let's not squander what many have fought and died for. I wish to thank the organizers of the event for their kind invitation to me to speak to issues related to equity at this important event, the launch of the children and COVID-19 advocacy briefs. You know, I, I don't think our Madiba moment has left us, so I'd like to invoke him again. As Madiba said on the 8th of May 1995, and I quote, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children, unquote. I would like to commend the authors and sponsors of this event. I've had the privilege of reading the document by Laurie, Maylene, Aslan and Michael and was hugely impressed by the ability to condense a large amount of information into a short advocacy brief. It's short enough for any policymaker to read, and I do hope that it will, set, it will be sent to as many of them as possible, and that we will make a lot of noise, including this on this webinar, to convince them to cause change. And now is the time. As many have said, if we don't rethink social reproduction now, it may be too late. Our responses to COVID-19 appear to have yet again revealed the fault lines in our country. The fault lines between the rich and the poor, the fault lines between those who have access to power and the powerless. The estimated 750,000 learners who have dropped out of school is one example of the stark reminder of the inequities in our society. These are the children of the poor, not the rich, whose opportunities to reach the potential have been further eroded thus contributing to the hundreds of thousands of South African youth who see no prospects of a job or a life well lived. The inequities in the structure of South African society arising from colonialism and reinforced by apartheid has pervaded every corner of our lives. Children born to poor families suffer the brunt of both the legacy of colonialism and apartheid and current crises that our, current, our country finds itself in. These children and their families need a leg up. Only a comprehensive reimagining of the structure of South African, the South African economy will provide the material conditions for children to thrive. While it is crucial that children survive past their fifth birthday, it is not good enough. Children must also thrive. And for this, we need not only recovery and building back better, but building back differently with a greater focus on equity so that every child has the material and social conditions to survive and thrive. 
The reinstatement of the 350 grant, as meager as it is, is a start, but we need to go beyond this. The recent appetite to consider the basic income grant is another step in the right direction. However, this too is not enough. It would appear that these considerations were only prioritized after the large scale looting in parts of KwaZulu Natal and Gauteng. While public primary schools in the country do not provide a suitable environment for children to learn, because they don't have toilets or running water or have 80 children or more in poorly constructed and ventilated classrooms, when some children have to rotate classes because they physically cannot remain one meter apart in terms of the social distancing we require to mitigate the spread of COVID-19, then they are clearly not prioritizing the health and well-being of the next generation, and we are not doing enough to reduce the inequities in our society. As Madiba repeated in, on the 27th of September 1997, the true character of society is revealed in how it treats its children. The COVID-19 pandemic has increased already entrenched levels of inequity in South African society with an unemployment rate in 2019 of 29%, which has risen to 32.9% in 2021, according to Stats South Africa. Stats South Africa also in the re latest release of the midterm estimates suggest life expectancy for both at birth for both males and females have declined quite considerably in one year at 3.1 percent at 3.1 year drop for males and a 3.8 year drop for females and the crude death rate has increased to 8.7 deaths per thousand people in 2020. equally troubling is that between march 2020 and december 2021 there was a 22.7% increase in institutional maternal mortality in our country, with an additional 179 deaths compared to the same period in 2019. More children are likely to have been orphaned, therefore, during the pandemic. In conclusion, the pandemic provides us with a unique opportunity to reflect on the type of society we have and what we would like to see it be. As Mandeep Tiwana of Civicus noted, the two urgent priorities are to one, rethink how our economies are structured and two, place the needs of the most excluded front and center. I thank you and wish you much strength in your endeavor to get those in power to do the right thing by the children of our country, especially in the midst of this pandemic, focusing on the most vulnerable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Technology. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jürgen. <laughs> Apologies for that little glitch. Thank you very much, Jürgen. And I think the key thing that you've challenged us on is really the question of how we build back differently. And with that, I really would like to introduce our editors, um, uh, Laurie Lake, who is the Communications and, Educa and Education Specialist at the Children's Institute at the University of Cape Town, where she plays a central role in the production of the annual South African Child Gate and is the chief editor of the Advocacy Brief series. And Professor Maylin Shun King, a health policy and system analyst from the School of Public Health and Family Medicine at the University of Cape Town, where her research focuses on aspects of child health and is also the co-editor of this. Um, over to you uh, to tell us some of the key um, highlights from the briefs. Thank you. A uh, very good morning to everyone and thank you so much to Tracy and Yogan for setting such a wonderful foundation for this launch. So as both Tracy and Yogan said, uh, the COVID pandemic had read, wreaked havoc and those in the health system and in many other sectors worked tirelessly to set systems and services in place to respond to this disaster. However, at the same time, assertions by key experts during the initial parts of the pandemic, especially that children were spared the brunt of the COVID-19 infection compared to adults. Whilst it was true in terms of relative numbers of child infections, it completely overlooked 
the disastrous collateral damage wreaked by the pandemic on many, many facets of children's lives. As the health system battled to cope with large numbers of sick adults, children's needs were somewhat sidelined. So this series of seven advocacy briefs highlight what those impacts on children were and what the responses from the health sector and the many collaborators from other sectors and civil society um, were over the past months. In the series of briefs, we specifically draw on the case example of the Western Cape. As even in this relatively well-resourced province, our initial responses in protecting children were unfortunately woefully inadequate. And we hope that the lessons learned from our work will help inform our future responses. So we present two briefs that show the direct impact on the COVID-19 infection on children and on routine child health services. Then we present five briefs that speak to the collateral damage on their nutrition and food security, their mental health and well-being, their exposure to violence and injury, their loss of access to ECD facilities and services, and finally, the impact on school children. So we would like at this point to acknowledge and thank all the authors for their wonderfully dedicated and sterling work that made this series possible. And together with the authors, also thanking the funders of the brief series, the Children's Hospital Trust and the Michael and Susan Dow Foundation. I can honestly say on behalf of all of us that child advocacy is truly alive and well. And I'm going to hand over to Laurie now to take us through some of the key findings of the briefs. And we look forward to all of your active engagement in the chat function. Please feel free to respond to each other's questions and comments um, in as much as the authors will also try and respond so that we can all learn together and make this a truly vibrant um, interaction. So thank you and over to you, Laurie. Thank you, Maylene. Um, I'm just checking to see that everyone can see my slides. Yes, we can, Laurie. That's fantastic. Um, so I'm going to start by talking to the findings from the first brief, which are focusing in on a child centered approach to COVID-19 care. In the first year of the pandemic, there were over 284,000 cases of COVID-19 in the Western Cape. And 12,300 of those were children. And out of the 12,300 children that we're seeing um, in the, the little pink figures in the middle of the screen, 1,500 were admitted to hospital and 59 children died of COVID-19. Yet thousands more children have been affected by the illness and death of family members, with over 1 million children around the world estimated to have lost a primary caregiver from March 2020 to April 2021. As health services prepared for the first wave, children's needs were in many ways sidelined. Resources were diverted from paediatrics to adult COVID-19 care and concerns around infection led to the separation of infants and children from much needed family support in hospital. Yet over time, child health specialists succeeded in advocating for a far more child and family centered approach to contact tracing and to the care of neonates and children in hospital in order to minimize stress and to improve patient outcomes. Other important child health considerations that still need to be addressed include emerging concerns around long COVID in children, as well as the need to put systems in place to identify children who are in need of care and protection when adults are admitted to hospital with COVID-19. So there is a need to be thinking about children even when we are providing adult services. We also know that COVID-19 disrupted in, in fairly fundamental ways the delivery of routine health services. 
Primary health care visits in children under five dropped by 23% from 2019 to 2020. Um, and that's the yellow curve at the top of the graph, leading to gaps in testing and treatment for HIV, TB and malnutrition in ways that are going to impact on children's health for years to come. At the same time, a concerted catch-up campaign driven by child health specialists and community health workers in the Metro helped to boost measles immunization coverage to 95%, which is 5% higher than in 2019. And this illustrates the, the, the power um, and potential of, of strong leaders and advocates for children and child health at every level of the healthcare system. At the same time, if we look at hospitals, paediatric and adolescent beds were reallocated to adult COVID care. Elective surgeries were cancelled and many children with disabilities were unable to access care. Hospital admissions for diarrhea and pneumonia decreased, perhaps in part due to the mask wearing, the hand washing and the social distancing measures that were put in place. Yet the in-hospital mortality rate increased, raising concerns about life-threatening delays in seeking care as children came in later and sicker. Concerted efforts by child health practitioners and community health workers helped ensure that some services were fully restored, but it is going to require time and ongoing advocacy and proactive decision-making to address the significant backlogs in elective surgeries, the treatment of children with disabilities, and to redress some of the damage that has been done due to the disruption of routine healthcare services at primary level. Handing over to, I think, Anita. Hi, good morning, Tracy. Can I start? I wanted to introduce you first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I go ahead? There we go. Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Laurie. And I think you touched on a very important thing on leadership. And um, I want to start by quoting uh, Julio Frank, who said, probably the most complex challenge in health systems is to nurture persons who can develop the strategic vision, technical knowledge, political skills, and ethical orientation to lead the complex processes of policy formulation and implementation. Without leaders, even the best designed systems will fail. So with that, I re we're really excited to welcome our new um, CEO at Red Cross Hospital, Dr. Anita Pabu. Um, she's been recently appointed as the chief executive of the iconic Red Cross Hospital. Um, she has a great interest in child health and is passionate about organizational culture, staff morale, and finding innovative ways of working to promote the synergy in the workplace while ensuring the highest quality of care. So over to you, Anita, to share your comments. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks very much. And thanks for giving me the opportunity. I think COVID has been a really challenging time um, for everyone, but particularly for leadership. And the challenges we face with regards to child health services is as for everything else in COVID, there was no rule book. Um, and particularly around child health services, there wasn't much information. So we really had to make it up as we went along. And being here at the Children's Hospital um, in, in March last year, we started by connecting with some of our colleagues um, in Italy and London in Children's Hospitals to hear what their experiences were um, at the time and also to see if we could learn from them and we could try and plan uh, not knowing how we would be affected with our very different uh, population of children and very different needs that we have here. I think um, from a leadership point of view, you know, the crucial thing um, 
uh, that helped us to to work through to to get to where we are today is really by having a collaborative approach. Um, in a time like this where there are no rules, it's really essential to bring in everybody who is an expert on some aspect of child health, and that really goes beyond the uh, general definition of healthcare in a, in a hospital, for instance. Um, I think we are all, and many of the presenters here, and the Children's Institute are really um, interested in, in, in uh, realizing children's rights. And so during COVID, it, it was really difficult, uh, but we had to at all times try and focus on the best interests of the child. Um, some of the challenges that we faced, for instance, in a hospital is that you know, how do you how do you try and protect all the children? So you're trying to provide a service where the really, really sick children can still come in and be treated. But also, how do you prevent them from being exposed to other children who are coming in who may have COVID? And those were very real challenges that we faced. Um, it's trying to balance the whole schools debate uh, that went on during the year last year. And we had to try and pull in experts to say, how do we weigh up the risks versus the potential negative effects of children not going to school. So it's the risk of exposure to COVID in a school environment versus um, them not uh, them staying at home and possibly not being in a safe environment, possibly being with an adult who is not responsible, um, having a, a poor access to not only education, but poor access to food for many children who, who get their main meal at school. So it was trying to balance up all those issues in terms of children's health. I think we at the hospital, one of the uh, big issues that we faced is also um, in the beginning, you know, the adult hospitals obviously to reduce exposure had to say no visitors, um, uh, nobody else to come to hospitals besides people who are sick. In a children's hospital, that's just not possible. And it's it's really not the way to go. At this hospital, we've always allowed um, one caregiver, the main caregiver, to stay at the bedside because we really think it's important as part of the holistic care of the child to have the main caregiver. So it was trying to balance the exposure of, of, of not swapping caregivers, so you reduce exposure to our staff, which we also had to protect, but to try and make sure that the child gets the care that they need. So, and I know that there are many other um, hospitals and institutions that also um, needed some guidance on, on what to do with uh, having caregivers because it does increase the exposure, but we had to find safe ways to doing that. Um, I think when it comes to children, as I said, besides COVID, um, there are there are no rules set out. So you do have to forge a way forward and leadership is required to make the best possible decision at a time when things are changing rapidly. I remember days we would make decisions in the morning about how to approach a particular challenge and then by the afternoon having to really reassess and say, actually, this is not working in one area of the hospital. We need to change the way we're doing things, but really important to remain curious, to remain open and be flexible to change what you're doing um, as new information came in. Um, sadly, we've had to, even as a children's hospital and child health services across the province have had to de-escalate some services. Okay, and that's a combination of being in lockdown, lack of transport, and, and really trying to reduce uh, non-essential visits to the hospital. But children are a very special group, and you'll find that they very little um, that is actually purely elective. Most of what they need um, uh, to get treatment for or management of is very time sensitive. So you can put it off for a few months, but eventually as they're growing, they're the efficacy of whatever treatment or management or uh, treatment plan they need um, becomes less efficacious the more time goes on as they grow older. So it was trying to balance those needs as well. As Jürgen said, you know, COVID really showed the fault lines and in the health system as well, uh, this was also true. And trying to um, pick up services where, where there were deep cracks and we're still trying to recover. Um, on the surgical side, you know, we really had to de-escalate elective surgery and we're still grappling with the fact that 
Um, there is no way we're going to be able to catch up, but how do we meet the needs of the children and still provide a good quality care? So I think in terms of leadership, the only guiding principle that we can work with is to always try and uh, consider the best interests of the child, but to work collaboratively as we are in such a forum today to talk about, to grapple with the issues and to try and make the best decisions going forward um, uh, for the best interests of the child. Thank you very much. Hi, should I dive back in again? Go ahead, Maybe. Laurie. Go ahead, Great, Laurie. fantastic. Um, and you can see my my slides. Yes. No. No. Uh, no, we I cannot see it. Them. Okay. Sorry, just give me a moment. Is we that can working? see them. Yes, we Great. can see them. Fabulous. Um, so the next set of slides are focusing on children's nutrition and food security. Um, drawing on the NIDS CRAM survey, we know that 47% of households ran out of money to buy food during hard lockdown and that child hunger has remained unacceptably high with one in seven households reporting that a child went hungry in April 2021. We also expect child hunger to intensify in the coming months um, due to a decrease in the real value of the child support grant, which is currently valued at 460 rand a month or 15 rand a day per child. And this has failed to keep pace with food price inflation. Um, and in addition, there are particular concerns in Gauteng and KZN um, where food supply chains have been disrupted. Um, so a concern that we are going to see a rise in acute malnutrition. At the same time, the disruption of routine health services has made it much harder to identify and support children who are at risk of acute malnutrition. Yet despite the rise in child hunger, findings from the Western Cape suggest that there was a decrease in the incidence of severe and acute malnutrition cases presenting at primary care facilities and a decrease in hospital admissions. And so one of the key concerns is whether this means there was actually a, a decrease at community level um, or whether things have shifted dramatically on the ground and we're simply not seeing it because that kind of data is not picked up um, in the district health information system. And that means those cases were not seen, they were not recorded and they were not treated. Um, so certainly severe and acute malnutrition is, is a particular concern moving forward. The next brief focuses attention on violence and injury. Early in the COVID-19 pandemic, child rights activists raised concerns about how rising unemployment, food insecurity and the stresses of lockdown would increase the risk of violence and injury, particularly within the home. And yet findings from the Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital found that there was a 15% decrease in children admitted um, to the trauma unit with unintentional injuries. And this was driven by a 56% decrease in road traffic injuries during hard lockdown. While injuries in the home, such as burns and falls, actually increased over the same period, again, because children were trapped at home and not out on the roads. There was also a 10% decrease in children presenting with non-accidental injuries. Um, this was driven by a, a sharp 50%
decreased during hard lockdown and the alcohol ban, after which you can see that cases climbed to pre-pandemic levels. Again, it's important to recognize that these figures do not necessarily represent a real decrease in violence and abuse because we know that lockdown made it extremely difficult for children and families to access services and support. And there is a real need to put proactive measures in place so that we can better identify and support both women and children who experience interpersonal violence during pandemics and similar crises. Um, and this really means identifying every possible point of contact um, and using that proactively um, to put support measures in place. That includes health, ECD programs, schools. We also know that the pandemic created a huge toll on, I think, everybody's mental health and well-being, and particularly children. And yet there's been very little research on children's mental health during the pandemic. What we know from previous humanitarian crisis crises is that COVID-19 is likely to trigger a dramatic increase in depression, anxiety and post-traumatic stress. At the same time, we know that the pandemic had an unequal impact on the mental health of children and adolescents and that that impact is shaped by their developmental age, their educational status, any pre-existing mental health conditions, their socioeconomic status. So we know that food insecurity, poverty are, are, are key stresses, as well as children's care arrangements and whether they have had a family member who was either infected or who died of COVID-19. Women in particular have been hard hit by unemployment, food insecurity, domestic violence, and an increased burden in childcare. And these additional pressures are likely to compromise both their own mental health and that of their children. In addition, most children have been exposed to some form of loss loss of school, loss of friends, or the loss of loved ones, and they need support to cope with loss and grief. We also know that specialised child and adolescent mental health services remain extremely limited in the South African setting and very unequally distributed. So there is a real need to build the capacity of families and frontline workers across a whole range of programmes to help children cope with both loss and adversity. Handing back over to you, Tracy. Thank you very much, uh, Laurie. And I think as you've alluded to and other speakers have alluded to, there's never been a imp more important time for us to focus on accountability, on inclusivity and agency and really being true to the mantra that nothing for me without me. Um, really, it's important to be inclusive, to really start working with those that are benef beneficiaries to help with the, some of the decisions that Anita was referring to, the difficult trade-offs, the complexity. And so we are very excited to welcome Sadiq Daniels, who is a 16-year-old in grade 10 at Vista Nova, he says he is differently abled, so has been able to explore many things. Currently, he is a radio presenter with um, uh, um, Red Cross Radio, and he has interviewed President Cyril Ramaphosa, and Sadiq is on the advisory council of the Western Cape Commissioner for Children um, after serving as a child government monitor for a year. We are very excited and very pleased to welcome um, Sadiq to be uh, uh, to give his comments around particularly participation and accountability. Welcome, Sadiq. Over to you. Everybody, good morning, everybody. Hope you are well. So my name is Christina Nomdo and I'm the Western Cape Commissioner for Children and I'm going to be in conversation with Sadiq. So I'm going to be in conversation with Sadiq so that we can hear Sadiq's views 
um, on his participation in the commissioner's office, his experiences of living with COVID, uh, you know, being affected by it in, in the society. So, Sadi, can you please tell us a little bit more about uh, what you do at RX Radio and what you have been doing with the commissioner's office? Uh, my role at RX Radio is I'm, I'm a radio presenter and I also chair in politics with Sonic. My show runs once a month every Saturday from 11 to 12. And I'm, and I'm a primary advisor for the commissioner's office and I, and I love working with the commissioner and with the other fellow monitors. So, tell us, Sadiq, how did you become a child government monitor in the commissioner's office? As I said before, I belonged to the children's organization named RX Radio and they nominated me for the commissioner's office. With the commissioner, how do you manage to talk to the commissioner? Isn't it COVID times? Are you getting together, hosting super spreader events? No, no, we not. We got the two hour session once a week. On the Thursday, by a WhatsApp chat, chat group. Sadiq, can you tell us what kind of topics you discuss with the commissioner every week? Sex morality, young issues, children's rights, children's participation in the religion, children's mental health issues and gender inequality. That sounds exciting. Um, I hope you enjoy these sessions. What were your kind of favorite things in the session and what has been your highlight of being a child government monitor so far? My favorite thing is what what uh, when I interact with the other children and my favorite activity is when we went to go present the national parliament. So you've gone up. So you say you you went uh, with the commissioner with a uh, group of children and you've presented in parliament to the uh, portfolio committee uh, talking about the children's amendment bill. Did you like that process? Did you think the parliamentarians listened to you guys? Yes, yes, I, I, I loved it because I, well, and I think they did listen to us because of the feedback we, we received. From, from the MPs of the Children's Amendment Bill. Fantastic, uh, Sadiq. I also hear that you get to write um, uh, and submit articles to newspapers about your work with the Children's Commissioner. You wrote about how it is to learn uh, and have schooling during COVID times. Can you share a little bit about what you said in your piece in the article? I said it, it was very difficult for me to learn because I, I, I find it very difficult to, to, to communicate via technology and, and that was the most difficult part for me. And plus, I couldn't com communicate with my friends. Yeah, 
I think um, COVID-19 was definitely an isolating time for all of us, yet you managed to make new friends uh, uh, with the other child government monitors, and you're speaking on a forum today. How does it feel to be able to share your thoughts with adult decision makers? You know, Christina, I actually feel quite honored and quite humbled to present here today in this webinar. Thank you, Sadiq. Is there any last words you'd like to share with us? I would just like to thank everyone for listening to me today. I appreciate it. Fantastic, Sadiq. We appreciate you and thank you for joining us on your rotational off day from school in case people think I'm keeping children out of school. <laughs> Tomorrow it's back to school for you and we also will release you now because you have your schoolwork to do. Thank you so much, Sadiq, for joining us. It's a privilege to have you here. Hi, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sadiq. What an inspired, what an inspiring conversation with the commissioner. Without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Laurie and Maylin to continue with um, the inputs that they found. And just to remind you that after they speak, we will be having a question and answer session. So if you have been stimulated with some ideas, some insights, or you have a question, please feel free to put it in our q and um, and then we will respond to you after this session. Thank you very much. Over to you, Laurie. Thanks. Thanks, Tracy. And so we also know that COVID-19 had a, a devastating impact on early childhood development programs. Um, ECD programs have the potential to support young children and their families, especially so in times of crisis, um, by enabling caregivers to seek employment and ensuring that young children receive safe care, good nutrition and early learning. Yet even prior to COVID-19, the ECD sector in South Africa was fragile, underfunded and deeply inequitable, with only one in six children attending an ECD, one of only, sorry, only one in six children um, attending ECD programs actually benefiting from the ECD subsidy, um, which includes a, a measure um, for food or nutrition support. Prolonged lockdown, limited state support and the withdrawal of the ECD subsidy in most provinces led to the permanent closure of many ECD programs and to significant job losses. With 43% of jobs lost and more than 105,000 jobs still at risk in August 2020. Removing an essential source of support in childcare at a time when families were grappling with the stresses of rising unemployment, poverty and hunger. And these blows to the ECD sector will cause both immediate and long term harm to the health, nutrition and education of young children. We also considered the role of schools as nodes of care and support. From March to December 2020, almost one in three schools in the Western Cape experienced COVID-19 infections amongst educators and learners. Yet less than 1% of learners contracted COVID-19 and 3,900 learners required quarantine, most from community-based infections. Yet despite these low numbers, widespread fears about learner and educator safety have prevailed and result and continue to result in repeated school closures. The costs to children's education have been incalculable, with most primary school learners in South Africa estimated to have lost close to a full year of learning between March 2020 and June 2021. 
together with a threefold increase in school dropout, with an estimated 750,000 learners dropping out of school. In addition, children lost out on an essential source of nutrition, healthcare and psychosocial support. Over 9 million children across South Africa lost out on a daily meal following the closure of the National School Nutrition Programme. And it was only through civil society litigation that the DBE was forced to resume school feeding across the country. And while the Western Cape was unusual in attempting to continue school feeding during lockdown, the rotation of classes continues to pose logistical challenges and coverage remains significantly suboptimal. So that's a, a short summary of the, the key findings. You'll find a whole lot more detail um, in the brief um, together with some examples of, of, of good practice um, because these challenges were, were, were not um, left unanswered. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to, to Maylene and to Tracy to facilitate the discussion and we would really welcome your, your questions and comments. Um, thank you, Laurie. Firstly, I think there's a number of questions as to whether the recording of the, the entire session, um, as well as the powerful point presentation could be made available to people as people are in various places in the country and aren't able to access fully. So is that a yes, Laurie? Absolutely. Um, the recording and the PowerPoint and the briefs themselves um, will be available on the Children's Institute website. Mm -hmm. So there was one specific question from Nozuko that asked about um, what ages children can get infected by COVID. And um, from the work that was done so far, um, I think it can affect children of any age. Um, I think the neonates are relatively spared, but in the figures that we have for the Western Cape and for the country, in fact, it, it cut across all ages. However, um, in the more recent months, we've noticed that um, certainly the older children and the adolescents are experiencing the greatest number of infections. However, when it comes to deaths, even though the deaths were a small um, number of the total number of infections, the greatest number of deaths were in children under the age of one and again in the ages 15 to 19, which suggests it has to do with comorbidities in the older age group. And of course, children under one are generally more vulnerable when it comes to such serious infections. Um, so yeah, certainly children of all ages. So here's a, a challenge question to all of us and um, Laurie you can jump in first but I think we all can actually weigh in on the question that Yogan asked us and he wants to know how will we ensure that the key messages get to policymakers, um, the president and his cabinet uh, for example because I think we all understand it's fine for us to have the briefs but that there's a whole process of engagement that it needs to get to the right ears, the right decision makers into the right spaces so that, um, as you said at the beginning, Yogan, that we build back differently and not just focus on recovery. So Laurie, I'm going to ask you to kick it off. Tracy, maybe you have ideas as the Deputy Dean from <laughs> the health science faculty um, and Yogan, maybe you want to weigh in and give us some ideas from your previous vantage point as the DDG of how we actually enter those spaces more successfully so that these issues are heard. Thank you, Maylene. Um, so I think Jürgen's absolutely right. Um, the briefs for us are, are really, I mean, they're a the culmination of a lot of hard work and careful thinking and reflecting back um, on what's happened over the last year and a half, um, but also thinking very much about the way forward. You know, how do we build that better? How do we put children on the agenda? Um, and we've called them advocacy briefs. We haven't called them research briefs. We haven't called them policy briefs because we've recognised that these are, are essentially designed as tools for 
each person who is who's on the call today to take with them and um, to use them and um, to open up a conversation about children and, and to enable um, children and families to claim their entitlements. Um, so we are hoping, um, I, I guess one of the key challenges is that a lot of the decisions that have been made over the past year have not been made um, by child health specialists um, or, or people who are primarily concerned about the well-being of children. Um, so we're needing to get these briefs and, and the key messages out to decision makers who are responsible for the allocation of resources, um, particularly if we're looking at austerity measures being introduced. Um, so if Jürgen or Tracy is able to open up a, a door to um, the command structures um, who have really determined um, how we've responded to the pandemic, um, but also to government um, at the various highest level, that would be incredibly useful. Um, but also to recognise that change doesn't only happen there. It, it happens at the level of the district, the province, the facility, the school. Um, in each one of those spaces, we're hoping that, that these stories um, and, and the evidence will prove useful. Thanks, Laurie. And I think to add to that, we, we have to claim our space at these different tables. We have a number of people on this call that are great champions for, for children. I mean, we've got Christina as the Children's Commissioner, very high level position. Um, we have you, Yogan, for example, also a great advocate for children, Tracy, and, and various other practitioners and um, civil society members. And then we have um, uh, uh, Sadiq, um, who is an absolute wonderful advocate for children, and who better to speak um, for children's issues than to hear it from, from children themselves. So I think we we'll have to devise maybe a, a more concerted strategy as to where those spaces are, who we can work through and with, and which champions can take our course forward. So I, I just want to ask you, Tracy, if you have any additional ideas, and then I, I, I do want to ask you, Yogan, if you've got any particular tips for us, because you've got so much experience in those spaces. Uh, you know, so I, I think that I think that uh, we must also celebrate the wins that we've had. And I think for COVID, even the 350 grant has been as a result of these kinds of initiatives. And I know that many of the people listening that have been part of the child gauge, that have been part of all these advocacy efforts as a community, we actually have been able to get to the ear of government. So for me, I, I think that we have been able to do it. And this is just but one of those initiatives. So I think we should continue doing the things that we are doing and do or, or always seek some avenues where we can do more of this. But I agree with you, Laurie, that change will happen when, you know, I believe in the butterfly effect that all of us can take, you know, it's a complex, big, big problem. But all of us, if we take just one part of this huge elephant and start biting and all of us bite from different angles, we will get there. And for me, I'm really motivated and inspired by what I've seen this community do at this uh, at this stage. So I think uh, we are on to something here and I think we must just build on it. And I think I, just, I do want to raise, though, that something that did come up is that even though this is fantastic work, that it, it is not fully represent, representative of the country. We do know that the Western Cape is very different. The context in the Western Cape is relatively more different, different than other parts of the country. So the question that I did see that you might want to touch on, Laurie and Maylene, is if there are plans for us to be more inclusive of including other provinces as well. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. So maybe before we get to that, um, Yogan, any any suggestions from your side on how we can actually get these issues heard at the highest level of decision making? Really, thanks very much. And I, I must say I agree with both Laurie and Tracy. Um, you know that uh, there are many touch points and we must reach as many of them as possible, mm -hmm. but we need to tailor the message to the touch point, you know. Uh, people on the ground, people at different levels in the system, 
are triggered by different things uh, and oftentimes it's very concrete things that we need to kind of put up and put out there. So, you know, having a general advocacy brief is good, but I think it needs to be tailored to specific audiences depending on what the ask is. And I need to, I think we need to be clear on the ask because one of the things that I've been thinking a little bit about is, you know, if I had to, if I had to respond to my own question, what will success look like for this collective? You know, there's there's seven different things, uh, you know, that that we've touched on in the in the advocacy brief, um, you know, and I'm sure we could add a few more, but for each of those, or for the composite number of seven, what would success look like, and who would it be successful, you know, for? So if you take the 350 grant, I think I agree with you fully, Tracy, that you know it's great that it's come back and it's come back because of advocacy. How will we ensure that it gets to the children and it makes a difference for the most vulnerable children? You know, because that's the key question. Getting the policy decision is great, but getting it to the, the last vulnerable child is what really we should be focusing on. So the key question is, you know, how do you, for example, if we take the 350, how do we ensure that the most vulnerable children get it and do benefit from it? So I think those are the kind of granular questions that arise from this, I think, very rich dialogue. I can, I can, I know some of the uh, the ad, uh, the uh, the advisors to the president. So I I will certainly uh, email this after this call uh, to to some of them to ensure that it gets uh, gets some coverage at least uh, amongst the advisors. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jürgen. And I think that is so important to to actually collectively use our networks and our um, gravitas, as it were, our agency to try and make a difference. So, Laurie, there's a question to us. Um, are we going <laughs> to do uh, similar briefs uh, on other provinces? And so um, I'll just kick start off by saying I think we focused on the Western Cape eh, because we are in the Western Cape. Um, and we had a funding opportunity to particularly focus on the Western Cape experience. Um, and while there's always the assertion that the Western Cape is different and unique and so on, perhaps not that much. Um, we also struggled enormously here in the Western Cape to get children's issues initially on the table, and it took a lot of hard work in the different spaces where we operated to get the decision makers to acknowledge that we need to develop guidelines, action plans, responses for children. So it was not that straightforward, even though we are a, a slightly better resource province in many different ways. It did require us coming together as a tremendous collective of child health um, people across different platforms to work together towards getting responses in place. So, so it's not that unique from that point of view. However, um, we, we just felt that um, each province's experience was so contextually different that it really would have required us to get into the nuances of what was going on. And it's not for us in the Western Cape really to talk about the experiences of other provinces without actually engaging significantly with all the colleagues who also mustered incredible responses in, in all of the, the other eight provinces in the country. So let's not forget that. Um, but I think it would require obviously some discussion and negotiation with colleagues from the other provinces to see if there is any energy left and any appetite left to do um, something similar. Um, so I will leave it at that and just um, also say that in a number of the briefs, we do allude to experiences from, from other provinces. We do draw on case studies from other provinces as well. So it's not exclusively just the Western Cape experience, even though the main focus was the Western Cape. Laurie, would you like to add anything to that before I hand over mm -hmm. to Tracy to take us to the break? Um, I think just the, the one thing to note is um, that there are actually a series of eight advocacy briefs. Um, so the overarching brief um, and the set of findings that I presented today are really the, the headlines coming out of each of those seven briefs. Um, and if you're interested in finding out the specific concrete recommendations around ECD or education or routine health services, 
um, you will find that detail in the individual briefs. And that's because we 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 recognized, I think when we started, we thought we could put together just one brief. Um, and then as we dived into the data, we realized that, um, yeah, that what's happened in each sector has been quite complex. Um, so we've told the story sector by sector, um, because that's that's the kind of level of detail that's necessary um, to present the evidence in a meaningful way and to provide recommendations that are speaking specifically to that audience. So we hope that the full set will will prove useful and that you'll tap into the ones that are most meaningful for you and your work. So um, before I hand over to Tracy to close off, I just wanted to acknowledge that there are some questions um, on mental health resources at community level. There's questions on the psychosocial aspects, which I'm hoping that the relative brief authors um, will respond to in the in the Q&A session. Um, there's issues of how do we truly um, center children's needs? Um, and perhaps that's something that Mark Haywood could pick up um, in the final session um, and um, and there's issues around um, the uh, the need for intersectoral collaboration uh, as we move forward, which is of course an absolute essential aspect. Um, so I'm going to encourage everyone to continue responding to the others on the Q and A because we are not the the only holders of of, of knowledge and ideas here. Um, everyone on this chat. Um, has those knowledge and ideas. So, so Tracy, from from Laurie and I and all the other mm. authors of the briefs, we really wanted to thank you enormously for for holding and facilitating the session so excellently and for setting the stage so beautifully um, at the beginning. Thank you very much for your time and I'm handing back to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, and to the speakers and to, to the panelists. And I think what, what is very clear, and I think just building on Jorgen's comments, is that there is always this need for us as advisors, as researchers, as policymakers, to try and pick that one thing. What is that one thing that we can do to be able to make a change? And I think, as Laurie was saying, it's very difficult because it's very complex. And so the next session is really going to start to try and grapple with that complexity to say that even within this complexity, could we find our way? Could we find a path that would lead us to policy changes that really make an impact on children's lives? And with that, I think our session is over and we would like to take a break and allow you to take a leg stretch. And if you could be back, Let's try and be quick, um, three minutes, and we will start the next session as we change over at 10 minutes past 11. Thank you very much. Over to, I uh, will take a break and then hand over to Mark. Thank you.
Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome back from your comfort break. Uh, and thank you very much for being with us uh, this morning. Um, the topic of this second part of this morning's webinar is what can we do to address these complex challenges? Uh, we've heard the problems presented uh, through the briefs uh, and through the presentations uh, in the last hour. The question is, what are we going to do about it? And I think to describe it as a challenge is a gross understatement because what we are facing is a multi-dimensional crisis in the lives of children in South Africa and across the world. As I was listening to the, the presenters earlier on, it's, it reminded me of something that I'd read in a recent book called uh, Rescue from Global Crisis to a Better World by somebody called Ian Golden. And Ian Golden said in that book, young people's prospects have been blighted by their unstinting sacrifice for the elderly. As after the world wars, we owe them a better future. Our scientists have done what they can to rescue the elderly. Now we also need to rescue the young people. So that's the question. What do we need to do to rescue the young people who have been the collateral damage uh, of our response to COVID-19? And to help us begin to answer those questions, we will now hear three uh, different perspectives uh, on the question. Uh, we'll hear a practice perspective from Dr. Nomlindo Makubalo uh, from the Eastern Cape, and Dr. Makubalo will speak from the perspective of somebody who is working in another of South, Africans, pro South Africa's provinces, but a province which does not have the resources and the co coordination and the capacity uh, that we know exists in the Western Cape. Following Dr. Makubalo will be Karabo, uh, advocate this time, advocate Karabo Oza, who is the uh, director at the Center for the Child at the University of Pretoria. And she will talk a little bit about what the law has done and what the law can still do or what the constitution can still and should do to advance children's rights in this context. And finally, we will hear from Professor Mark Tomlinson, who is the co-director of the Institute for Life Course Research, Life Course Health Research at UCT, who will give us something of a global perspective on these issues. Each of our speakers will speak for five minutes, and we will have 15 minutes at the end for discussion and questions, and we would encourage you to use the Q&A uh, in the meantime and we will try to pick some of the questions uh, and throw them back at the speakers after their initial presentations. So thank you, Dr. Uh, Makubalo. Uh, the floor is yours to talk about the pers your perspective and your experience in the Eastern Cape. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, uh, Mark, and uh, thanks for inviting me. I will uh, kick off by first uh, talking about my experiences in Eastern Cape. Um, during the pandemic, one of the first things, as it was highlighted by the previous speakers, was the decrease in THC utilization rate, especially in children. Uh, this really translated to um, low immunization rate, uh, low immunization coverage. As a result, what we are currently seeing now was seeing increase in the real cases, especially there's a lot of children presenting with the rotavirus, 
We have seen a couple of children with uh, hemophilus uh, meningitis and who have missed the immunization. And what is said is when you ask them, why didn't you go for immunization? Uh, it's clear it's because um, the clinic was closed or we, I didn't have money to take my child to, to the clinic. And there's also an increase uh, in children with complicated TB uh, who have actually, the, because all the resources have pulled to, towards the COVID, now there's no one who's screening children and providing the prophylaxis. And also a lot of children who are defaulting ARVs um, that who have come up with immunological and virological failure. And uh, there's increase in some uh, cases and not only just some cases, also with uh, deaths as well. And reasons, no money to buy food, I've lost my job and I have no ID to go to home affairs and make um, an ID. And also I don't have money to go to Sasa. These are the realities that we see all the time. And there's increase in hospital admissions with children with uh, actually secondary uh, to social cases from abuse and poor home circumstances. And there has been a lot of child-headed uh, families that are vulnerable. And one of the other things that is remarkable, uh, we have actually, it's said that I've, we have experienced children being sacrificed for adults by pulling all the resources uh, to focus on, on adults. Like, for example, currently the, the World based outreach team is all about vaccination, is all about tracing, and there's poor integration at that level. Some hospitals in, in Eastern Cape, the ward, uh, pediatric wards have been closed and taken uh, by the adults. So if the, the, the resources needed, the first target is always pediatrics. There's no adequate uh, preparedness for COVID-19 in pediatrics and neonates. In some hospitals, you still find um, a special neonates being separated from the mothers when they have COVID, uh, they are COVID positive. Separation anxiety is enormous when it comes to children because there's no adequate space for larger mothers and still keep the social distance. Children with long-term health condition have been taken out uh, from school by parents because they have no alternatives. And um, But how can we address these issues and challenges? Uh, we need to put children first uh, as, as the country. And this calls for a, a good leadership that has best interest in heart for children at all levels, not uh, just political, but in, in, in all levels. And we also need to make um, uh, sure or to assist by making uh, it a point that the child's rights are protected. So every child has a right to basic nutrition, shelter and, uh, and uh, health care. But it is everybody's business to protect and respect uh, and fulfill those rights. So we need to create demand at community level for child health services and, and empower the communities to demand their children's rights. Um, Warbot or world-based outreach team, they need to focus on child health services, especially when it comes to promotive and preventative care and uh, to educate uh, the community about danger signs, give clear messages, early detection and intervention of those children at risk. In their sectoral collaboration is very critical. We need to realize that as health, we cannot do this alone. And the clinics need to prioritize children and the services should be rendered for children at any day, at any time. And we need to create um, child-friendly services. And um, at district level, program managers need to take leadership when it comes to children's rights. And I would like us to advocate to, to, to have uh, a children Dr. Makabala, we've we've lost you. Um, I'm not sure if it's just me, but I I, I think we've lost 
uh, Dr. Makubalo. Yeah, I think we have lost um, Numlindo Mark. Um, maybe um, Garth and um, uh, can try and see if they could get her back and we could possibly then go on to um, our next speaker, Carabo. Okay. While well, we while we're waiting for her to come back and finish. Thanks, Maylene. Uh, we will give Dr. Makobalo uh, extra time when it comes to the discussion because I think she was helping us by just beginning to set out the things that need to be done uh, if we're to improve uh, the situation of children in the Eastern Cape and their access to uh, quality healthcare services. So, uh, moving on. Um, we're going now to uh, Carabo, Advocate Carabo Oza from uh, the Director of Center for uh, the Child, a uh, person who specializes in children's rights. And the question of children's rights is something that has been a theme throughout this webinar in which uh, Dr. Makobalo touched on briefly as well. So uh, over to you, Carabo. Thank you for, for joining us. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, maybe to just quickly correct, I am Karaba Oza, not advocate, so I don't want to be accused of misrepresenting myself. I'm, I'm an admitted attorney of the High Court and do Sorry. attend the High Court, <laughs> but it's all good. Um, and it's the Center for Child Law, Mark. <laughs> so thank you again for this opportunity. And I will pick up where um, uh, Dr. Makubalo was actually getting to, which is the, the Constitution and the rights. So the rights uh, in the Constitution, in the Children's Act, and all the other laws that we have in our country are only as good as we make them out to be. Um, and one of the things I'm excited about, about the briefs that are being launched today is the fact that they actually try to actually link with those rights. So you're creating evidence or generating evidence that one can use to actually advocate for um, better uh, provision for the rights that are set out in the laws, because if we don't do anything about what stands in the constitution or the laws, those rights mean nothing for our children. Um, as I was reflecting for today, uh, and I'll come back to linking it with the law, I was thinking about, well, we have the before, the during, and we still kind of during, but we also have to start looking at what will be after once if, you know, COVID subsides. So we know already, and I think Dr. Jürgen Pile touched on this, that there was already a challenge in relation to provision uh, for some of the rights of children before COVID. And COVID did is that it's highlighted the gaps. I mean, if you look at the issues concerning to schools and the issue of overcrowding, there were already issues in relation to that. What happened now is because you have to do a social distancing, that is exacerbated. If you look at the issue of ECD, it was mentioned. There was already not enough funding for ECD. Um, and when COVID came, that became very stuck. It even led to a court case. So now the question is, um, you know, since we are in this space where we've now seen that when the response to COVID came, children stood uh, stood to lose more, uh, and there's no other way of putting it. How do we hold duty parents accountable? How do we come to the table with information that actually shows that we are actually at this stage, at the, at the point where we're even regressing? on what we have uh, 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 agreed to as a country in relation to provision and protection of, of children's rights. And let me quickly go back to the ECD case. I mean, we had the ECD case as well as the uh, the, the case, the school nutrition uh, uh, case that were mentioned by Lori. And for me, what those two cases did was to do one very important thing. For, well, one first important thing is they highlighted the interrelatedness and interdependence of, of rights. And I think the briefs actually highlight that. So you have the different themes that have been mentioned, but one of the big takeaway is that we cannot continue to have the siloed approach in relation to provision for rights. And uh, uh, the colleagues from CI uh, will remember when we intervened in the school nutrition case, that's what we went into highlight that you can't say as Department of Education, oh, we only give them uh, food as the extra um, kind of for when they're at school. So when they're at home, it's not really our responsibility. And those are the were very important discussions to be had about what do the rights mean in the constitution? What are section 29 being read with section 28 being read, um, you know, with, with, uh, um, with the other section like section 24 in the constitution? What do they really mean? And the fact that you cannot separate it, a child is not somebody that you separate. When you are at my school, you I only give you uh, uh, education. Whether you eat or not is not my problem. We know that that affects the educational outcomes. We know that these children who are come from very uh, sad socioeconomic circumstances, which are the majority of our children in our country. So the briefs highlight that interrelatedness, which we must take away. So it, it, it's a challenge to us to always advocate in a way that makes it clear that the rights of children cannot be split 
by people uh, or duty bearers when as uh, when it suits them. They all have a duty to see children holistically. I can't say I'm just the minister of this and therefore my duty ends when the child leaves my clinic. And I know that there are policies uh, and interdepartmental protocols that kind of start to allude to that, but I don't think that has been taken up as, as much as it should be. So for me, that's one of the things we should focus our energy um, very much uh, in and making sure that we, we as I said, the, the evidence that's generated by institutions such as the, C, such as the CI, which is very important evidence, we actually um, use that. And as it was said earlier, we then also spread spread this kind of research to other provinces so that we bring the lived realities of children to the forefront when we do the advocacy, because that's again in the ECD case and in the school nutrition program, it, the, the lived realities of children, the call phase that the children, uh, you know, were starving, the children had nothing. Uh, when you end up having to, you know, unfortunately go to court because people are failing. When you put that before the court, they can see the failures, but also it also reminds the, the, the people who are, are the, 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 the beneficiaries of their rights that they have recourse and they're not being done a favor and they have agency to be assisted and to actually enforce those rights. And I think Dr. Numlinda was also saying about how we educate the parents to actually insist on accessing education for the children. Uh, I'm mindful of time. So my last very important point that we all need to talk about, and I know colleagues from CI, we're talking about this already, is the money. So I already mentioned that there's a regression. There's regression on budgets. Uh, there's so many competing interests. And even in that sphere, we're already so. We did a bit of work last year. We're already seeing that children's provisioning is already losing out. And we need to actually do a lot of work around the budgeting for children's rights to try and to, to advocate for the mitigation of the regression and actually to ensure that we don't see further losses because we are sitting, uh, again, the stats are being said about how there's about a million, almost a million children who are out of school. Who's going to find them? What does that mean for their future? Why is DBE and social development not uh, uh, coming together and coming up with a plan to say, let's find these children in our communities. Let's offer some kind of uh, assistance to the, ch to, to the families. And those are the things that we need to do going forward to try and address those challenges that we face currently. And we cannot wait. You know, every day, some of the children are becoming adults, adults with nothing. Uh, Mark mentioned the issue of the youth. We don't even get into the youth because if we don't equip them, if we don't help them before they become the youth, then our youth we know already currently is already in dire situations and we, that will just continue to happen. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, and I think we all, lastly, one of the most important is that we all united in actually wanting to um, advocate, litigate and do whatever is necessary to for better protection of children's rights. And that for me is very encouraging. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, uh, Karawo. Uh, for those powerful words and and those challenges uh, to us to to use the law and we'll come back to this question of how we do that and how we center children uh, and apologies also for mis uh, describing you uh, uh, and calling it the center for the child instead of the center for child law which does such very very important work around uh, children's rights so we'll move now to our third uh, uh, presenter uh, who is Professor Mark Tomlinson. I've already introduced Mark. He's a well-known researcher, writer, advocate for children's interests and children's rights. And Mark is going to give us something of a global perspective, I believe, an overview of the crisis that uh, COVID has presented us with that in uh, Karabo's words is leading to a regression in the standing of children uh, in South Africa and all over the world. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark, and thanks to Laurie and the CI for for this amazing set of set of briefs. Um, I want to go back to something Jürgen said at the beginning um, when he when he called up that quote of Madiba about there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way it treats our children. Um, if we if we consider that, I I suppose part of the the sadness in me is I'm not sure we've done very well in in honoring um, that statement of, of, of Madiba. Um, and those two fault lines that Jürgen spoke about, the fault lines between the rich and poor and the fault lines between the powerful and the powerless that have been so um, apparent in COVID, I think a, th a third fault line is our children. And I want to remind everyone of an image that 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 is that has been with me for seven years and and there's 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 lots of difficult images in 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 South Africa but this is an image for me which I've written about which I I think about quite a lot and that's when in 2014 that little boy Michael Kamape at five years old 
you know, in, in, in that little village in Limpopo, went to the toilet while he was at school. And it couldn't hold the weight of that little five-year-old, and he, he then drowned in that latrine. Um, I think, of course, everything is complex, and there's so many voices speaking for so many things. But what I want to make a, a very urgent plea for is I, I do think there's one thing that ties all the complexity together, and that's children and adolescents. It's the one thing that, that people are going to find hard to say, we don't care about the children. It's going to be saying, if we make a decision about whether we should allow advertising of alcohol to children, people might say, well, of course, advertising of alcohol should be allowed maybe with that, but maybe we shouldn't advertise to children. That when the Department of Transport decides to build a road, that when they think about where to put that road, that it's not just about getting the truck to get the goods from one place to another, but it's also about will it be in a place that keeps children safe from being hit by those trucks? Will it make sure that the parents, the caregivers of that child are able to get that child to a clinic when they need to? Because we know that, for example, something like child mortality, maternal mortality is very closely tied, not only to poverty, but also to geography. If you live in deep rural Eastern Cape and a long way from the clinic, you are more likely to die as a caregiver um, when you're pregnant because you can't get to the, to the hospital or to the clinic. And when you die um, giving birth, the other children are more likely to then die because they don't have their mother around anymore. So I've been part of the uh, Lancet Commission called the Future for Our World's Children. And this basically says, let's put children at the center of every single decision we make. It's not just about making decisions in social development about preschools or centers. It's about, in fact, the children and adolescents should be put at the center of every single decision we make because we have got massive new threats coming. It's not just COVID, it's climate breakdown. And you just need to look around right now and you can see the fires, the floods and everything that's happening in our country as well. And so how do we put children at the center of everything we do? And I would suggest that when, when we do that, that in fact, had we done that, that Michael Kamapi would be alive today. Because if you put children at the center of things, you cannot have a situation where there's a school with a dilapidated pit latrine. Because if there's a child dying in a pit latrine, I'm afraid everything else we do feels to me fairly inconsequential because that's actually not, with our resources, a difficult thing to make sure it happens. Um, and so I just want to make a, a plea for let's find a way to put children and adolescents at the center of all our decisions and let all decisions flow in one way or another from that. And then we will be able to protect the aged, but also then do better, do better by our children. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mark, again, for that, that, that challenge and, and to accept your challenge and to frame it in, 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 a, in a slightly different way is we talk about COVID recovery, but how can we measure COVID recovery by the recovery of children and children's rights? Because on the same set of principles, if children recover, everybody else should be lifted out of this crisis that we have been undergoing. So we now have 15 minutes for any questions or comments. Uh, there were two questions that I'm going to put to each of the three speakers, starting with uh, Non Lindo, because she got cut off early. I think she's back with us again. Uh, um, that were carried over from the previous uh, uh, session, which, one of which is how do we center children's needs? And I would say children's voices uh, in all of these discussions, because it is often the invisibility or let me pose that as a question. Is it the invisibility of children uh, or the apparent invisibility that allows such terrible regression uh, on children's rights? And secondly, uh, for all the three speakers, how do we improve intersectoral collaboration around these questions? I've, I've seen some offers on the chat of people saying that we need to work together on all of these issues, but how do we make sure that we work together, not just around the webinar, but on an ongoing basis and around a set of indicators and measures and clear uh, uh, objectives. Uh, Karaba, I th think it was, who said 
uh, put the challenge to us, how do we find the children who have fallen out of the schooling system, the 750 or, mi or mi 750,000 or a million children, how do we trace them and get them back into the schooling system? So those are two questions that I've got up to now, and I'm going to start with uh, Nomlindo, uh, Dr. Makobalo, and then move to Carabo and uh, back to Mark. Nomlindo. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry that I got cut off. Um, I will start with the first part. I think we need to actually make children to participate. Uh, I feel that we are not uh, giving them a chance to speak for themselves. So uh, we need to empower children about their rights and actually give them an opportunity to speak for themselves. Because it seems as if um, they, they are not seen as full human beings. <laughs> they get ignored. So I think empowering the children. I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that we can actually do what Western Cape is doing and also have resources where children can speak for themselves. The second part about uh, intersectoral collaboration, we need to go back to the drawing board. It used to work well to actually have the war rooms uh, which are actually fully functional, where all these other departments are going to be there and it sits maybe on weekly basis and then uh, the cases are actually discussed and then it will go back to actually utilizing the ward based teams to be able to identify the vulnerable household to be visible and not to be utilized for something else. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Makobalo. Karabo. Uh, Thank you very much, Mark. So I agree in relation to the aspect of making sure that children have their own voices and they're being heard. We see it today here uh, with uh, um, the commissioner um, from the Western Cape uh, bringing her child monitor uh, as to the to the process. But I want to just uh, maybe mention something. As we're educating children about their rights and their voices, we must also educate the parents. So we take it for granted that almost 30 years after having our constitution, um, everybody's receptive to the idea of children having voices and having their rights and from my work I've seen pushback so we also need to actively remind people I always say people sometimes you speak to adults and they say oh these children have too many rights and I actually literally say here's my constitution so show me which section in the constitution is too much for a child and we need to actually do that intentionally because not all of us we all child rights um, advocates here on this platform we we you know we mostly work in spaces where we are like-minded but the outside there we have parents we have caregivers we even have people in the government that we sometimes have to fight with for them to actually remember that they have obligations to children and that children are not just objects um, so that is very important that we do that together um, and then I wanted to quickly also say that there's something that worries me and it links with collaboration again in the work that we're doing is that there's there's a bit of apathy so mark uh, you know introduced my my response as talking to the law and constitution and i i always when i said sometimes i feel sad in my office um uh, uh, but i do pick myself up and fight again as the one thing that worries me is how you cannot litigate or actually um um, codify care you know I know we talk about it, we could potentially and the laws require that but how do we make people actually realize what did they, what they do in relation to children or to children is so important and it matters and how they do long-term damage and that's something that worries me I can go to court and get a beautiful judgment and and still have you know as this the situation about you know uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the deceased Michael Kwame is mentioned we all know the responses that came when people were trying to defend themselves after that incident and that for me showed that lack of care and empathy for the family mark here can tell you how the section 27 has had to litigate about that case and every time I reflect about those kind of cases I worry because for us you have to actually go to court to try and say to people well you need to care more about children and you actually have a constitution and the children's act and the schools act that says you must do that that worries me and I think we must take our our representatives in the government we must also take them up about what it actually means what their obligations mean 
in practice, in, in the fact that, you know, when they're sitting making decisions, they must remember that there's a real life child and the obligations to that child mean something. And for me, I think that along the way, people lose it. Um, and when we write them letters of demand to try and enforce things, they they they, they think that, you know, oh, yeah, here they come again. But actually, we, they have to do their work and also they have to collaborate. I've already mentioned the cases where there is an issue about collaboration. For instance, some of us are litigating in the courts for the courts to give orders that actually force three or four government departments to collaborate and come up with a protocol. Obviously, the implementation of it becomes a different problem, uh, uh, but we need to actually put more effort to, 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 to that. And as I say, I go back to my starting point is that you can't divide constitutional rights and say my obligation begins here, yeah, yours. And then if we were to reflect about that and package our message uh, in that way, maybe we could also get, um, you know, the duty bearers to think a lot about it. I think as a sector, the child rights sector, you know, the civil society, we do that quite a lot. We we actually gain a lot from working together, but the people we're trying to hold accountable, we're always getting um, that uh, pushback and we need to invest a lot more in making them realize that they have a duty to collaborate for a better provision and protection of children's rights. Thank you. Thanks, Karabo. And, and while you were talking, I, I saw Yogan Pillay make a suggestion and I think it's a serious suggestion that we should encourage the president to appoint a minister for children's rights uh, and welfare, which uh, given that I think something like 30 million people in our country are under the age of 18 uh, is not far fetched uh, at all. And perhaps that's a, an, an advocacy issue or demand that uh, we could return to to discuss further at some point. Mark Tomlinson, children's needs and voices and intersectoral collaboration. Um, thanks, Mark. And um, Jürgen has somewhat stolen my, my thunder in that, that <laughs> question. Um, so I, I think one of the things that happens around intersectoral cross-department collaboration is that everybody holds on to their turf. They, they don't want to lose their funding um, and they want to do the things they want to do. And, and that's not a South African thing alone. That's global. Um, cross-sectoral collaboration um, hasn't worked in, in very many places for a very long time. And I do think that the one way to make that happen is whether it's a, a cabinet minister, a national child commissioner like Christina is in, in Western Cape. And I think that would be a really, you know, perhaps she could also be transferred to national. Um, Western Cape wouldn't like that. But, but I think, and not just, and not the, but the reality is it can't just be uh, a nice sounding designation. It has to come with, with money and power. The reality is we know the treasury holds probably the most power in any government because they hold the purse strings. And so it has to be, if it is a, a position, uh, a commissioner, a cabinet minister, whatever it might be, it has to come with power and the ability to, to force people to sit together, to force people to share budgets when children and adolescents' rights are uh, and, 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 and their care and their, their, their life course um, is... Um, is at stake. Um, so that would be my my plea. And, and, and just to say as well, of course, we, we don't do well at listening to children. Um, very often we uh, we say, it, it would, uh, maybe I'll give a brief example. There's a, there's a, there's a wonderful, wonderful uh, child rights activist, I suppose, called um, Al, Al Mars, who's at, at Rodin High School in, in, in Joburg or whatever. And we were on a webinar with her and she, she spoke gave a speech and then in the question time she followed Helen Clark. Helen Clark, the ex-Prime Minister of New Zealand, who's now a global leader. And Helen Clark said something that Almaz didn't like about, didn't like particularly. And so Almaz um, said, no, you know, your, your honor or whatever she called her, um, thanks for your comments, but I think you might be wrong on that. And she was appropriate, spot on and brave and polite and, and everything. And Helen Clark loved it. And those are the voices we, we have to we have to put up front. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Thank, thank you, uh, Mark, for that. Um, and again, conversation has continued in the chat. We only have five minutes left before I ask uh, for the vote of thanks. But uh, Laurie or Maylene, do you have any questions you've picked up that you'd like to uh, present or to ask to our three panelists uh, just very quickly, Maylene or Laurie? Um, hi, Mark. But perhaps not a question to ask, but just to say from a collection of the comments in the chat, um, 
Uh, there's a number of, of comments that speak to us having to master a whole of society approach, which obviously speaks to the integral and interrelated rights and needs of children. Um, but a number of suggestions came from where are the grassroots spaces in communities um, where um, uh, people have spoken about some communities having spaces where children um, have social engagements, um, and um, uh, sort of physical activity engagements and so on that could be perhaps used as springboards in that community for then linking other services to those spaces. So, so, so how do we better capitalize on existing spaces, existing initiatives and so on where those spaces and engagements such as schools and ECD facilities becomes nodes of support through which all other engagements could link to and, and, and in that way foreground children's needs and responses to children's needs. So, um, so yeah, I think that's 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 some very key suggestions coming from the group. So how do we really build a movement in a way for child well-being from the grassroots right up into the presidency? I don't have an answer straight away. <laughs> Thank you, Maylene, for that. Uh, there's just been a suggestion that I asked Christina to say a few words about your thoughts about uh, accountability. Uh, Christina Nomdo, the Child Commissioner of the Western Cape, welcome back. Uh, go for it. It's uh, thank you very much, Mark. It's very ironic that I find myself on this side of the uh, table because I used to be the activist putting a public figure on uh, on the spot to talk about their um, mandate, and now. Yeah, we are given the opportunity as the Western Cape Commissioner for Children to talk about our accountability to children and uh, in the Western Cape. Uh, I think I want to focus my points on centering the child and what we do in terms of centering the child. Um, and, and as Karabo has rightly said, you know, the duty bearers of children's rights are parents, public officials, and all other adults in society. So especially organizations working with children. And so the Western Cape Commission has the mandate to gather information, raise awareness, advocate on behalf of children, and advise and recommend a course of action, especially to the four government departments, which we have oversight over, education, health, social development, cultural affairs, and sport. So you want to know from me how I, are all these departments listening to the Children's Commissioner? But what I want to know is, are these departments, are all adults in society, yourselves included, willing to listen to children? So that's my mark that I hold myself to. And I ask myself, so, OK, it's COVID pandemic. Uh, I was appointed first June in the middle of the pandemic. How do I show that I listen to children? And we've developed some models of practice in the office. Uh, at the beginning of this year, for example, we had a learning in COVID times WhatsApp consultation with children. And we were able to pull together some infographics about what children's experiences are around distance learning, health protocols, being worried about finishing the curriculum, and also um, just like going back again in this year uh, and the pandemic persists. Everybody thought the pandemic would end with the with the calendar year. So uh, we we do that. And, you know, you've heard Sadiq speak. Sadiq is one of the child government monitors, and that's another way for me to listen to children. From the first day in office, there was a child government monitor who walked alongside me. There are now about 50 child government monitors across the Western Cape. Um, and I make a special effort to draw in children who, you know, are on the margins, the LGBTIQ plus communities, the, the children with disabilities, the children in rural settings who have no access. And you ask how we get to know children's lived realities. I shared with my team, Cameron, Tessa, Rufiwa, we will walk the streets 
That's how we will get to know what children's lived realities are like. If we want to reach children who are living on the street, we must go to the street and we must connect with children in those lived realities. I'm very happy to say that there's been a good response from the government departments with whom I work around when I report on visiting um, rural communities, because that's my focus, you know, to go out to rural communities. It's also safer during this pandemic um, experience. So I've already tabled a report around West Coast, two municipalities in the West Coast, and there we asked children and parents um, to, to talk, to recommend, to advise service improvements to increase well-being for children. And I'm happy to say that two of the four departments went through our report and comment by comment made by children, made by parents, were addressed by their response to me. And I'm now able to be that bridge back into the communities to advise what, what governments are saying. So this is what I hope to be a platform for children, but a bridge also between children and adults. One of the departments who we spoke to uh, when we played voice notes from children, when we showed charts drawn by children, acknowledged that this is authentic child voice. And so they must begin to sit back and reflect whether they are really addressing authentic child realities and authentic child voice. Mark, are you telling me to be silent or shall um, I wrap up? 30 seconds left, uh, Christina. 30 seconds <laughs> left. <laughs> so I want to say that, uh, you know, we hold ourselves to that standard of accountability of whether we are centering children, whether we model centering children, whether we build the bridges necessary for children's authentic voice to be heard by the decision makers, because that is their right for children to influence decisions about their lives. And we hope that this office can be one of those platforms for children to feel comfortable to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, for those powerful words. And thank you also for the powerful example uh, that you're setting uh, through your office. Uh, I hope there are people from other provinces uh, on this webinar who will want to get in touch with you and work out how to set up similar institutions uh, across these country, across the country, because it's clearly very, very important. So, so thank you. We're almost out of time. I, Carabo, uh, Nomlindo, and Mark, uh, if you have something you want to say that is burning and can be said in 30 seconds, uh, I will invite each of you to say your closing uh, comments. Uh, uh, Nomlindo, do you have anything final to say? Um. Thank you. I I just want to say we need to bring children's rights into realization as the country. Thanks. Thank you. A, a, a challenge. Uh, 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 Carabo. Um, just that we need to do this with uh, what Numlido said with great urgency because we are, you know, we are regressing and we need to actually push harder now. Uh, there's no better time than now. Thank you. Uh, Mark. Just to say, we all know we're in a crisis and and this is actually the time to change things. So please, let's do that. Thanks, Mark. In a crisis, absolutely. So before I introduce the people to make uh, just the closing thank yous, uh, Laurie Lake from the Children's Institute, I believe you have a, a closing slide uh, that you'd like to put up and uh, talk to. So Laurie, over, back over to you. Aha, uh -huh. OK, so that actually is the acknowledgement. No, no, I just want to go one back. OK, all right. <laughs> if I can go backwards, which is, of course, a whole other <laughs> challenge. So I just wanted to reiterate um, that there were seven guiding principles that we really pulled out um, across the seven briefs. Um, and I think many of the speakers today have have highlighted them. The first is no regression, no moving backwards, no matter what the crisis, um, that children's needs could need to continue to be prioritised, that essential services must be maintained, protected and restored, that we need to make sure that we leave no one behind, that we need to put additional measures in place to support those most vulnerable, 
that we need strong surveillance and referral systems to keep an eye on those children and ensure they access support and that that will require partnerships within and between departments, government and civil society, that it's essential to be listening to children so that we design responses um, that are meeting their felt needs and that we mobilize leadership and, and advocates for children at every single level of society. Um, so those are sort of seven principles that hopefully we can enact and, and carry with us moving forward. Um, and I'm just going to share the acknowledgements slide and hand over, I think, to Shanaz and Chantal. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to introduce Shanaz and, and Chantal just before I do. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, just two points of information I was asked to draw to people's attention. One is that we've now begun World Breastfeeding uh, Month, and we know how uh, critical uh, promotion and practice of breastfeeding is to children's health. And the second, we've talked a lot about voices uh, today, just to mention that on the evening of August the 10th at six o'clock, there's going to be a daily Maver Maverick webinar with the Red Cross uh, uh, Children's Radio uh, with a discussion between uh, a, a youngster, Alex White, and Slim Abdul Karim uh, on questions children have and have asked about COVID-19 and about vaccinations. So we hope that that will begin to give children a louder and a larger voice uh, in discussions of some of these, uh, the, the, these critical questions. So now just to move to the very conclusion of our uh, this morning's webinar, I'd like to ask uh, Chantal Cooper, uh, the director of the Children's Hospital Trust, uh, to say a few words, followed by Shanaz Matthews, the director of the Children's Institute, uh, who have uh, led uh, this very, very important research. Uh, Chantal, first over to you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm actually sitting here just feeling so inspired and to take Jürgen's words is just, you know, to go back and build back differently. And I think th these two elements that came out of this morning for me is that change is going to take place. There's no doubt about that. We have an amazing group of people today who've shared so many interesting ideas and evidence and, you know, and inspiration in terms of the, the way forward. But the other thing that really came out is the power of collaboration in that if we work together, we can make such a tangible difference in the lives of, of, of children. And I think just to acknowledge that this, these advocacy suites um, was made possible by the financial support of the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. And also to express our appreciation to Laurie and her team and the Children's Institute. Creating something like this um, is involves a tremendous amount of work. And so it was an incredible experience to work with you, Laurie, and the Children's Institute. And just deeply grateful by the outcomes because this is the start of something. This is the start of what Tracy was saying, building on the change that we've already started. And that even though advocacy takes place at different levels, every single one of us has a role to play. And so just to encourage everybody to, to take what has been presented today, what has been drawn together through the advocacy briefs and find a way to create that centralized notion of making children part of every single decision as we must move forward. Over to you, Shanaz. Yeah, um, I've got the last few words. Um, I think I'm incredibly heartened by this morning um, the rich panel we, discussion we've had, and it leaves me um, just to say that the, advo the child advocates that were part of this morning have laid the foundation for us to use these briefs in ways that I think we haven't imagined possible. So I really, you know, it leaves me to thank the panel, Christina Nondo, Children's Commissioner, an amazing child government monitor, Sadiq, uh, who just showed us the power of including children in, in these kinds of conversations. Importantly, also, uh, Nomalinda Makubalo, Karaba Oza, as well as Mark Tomlinson for your in insights and also pointing out a path for us to be uh, following. 
Um, our program chair is Tracy Naledi and Mark Haywood. Thank you for keeping us on track and weaving in the different parts of the conversation that's so important. And I forgot Jogan, but most importantly, Jogan, I think your insights and, and also your promise to us that you will be sending these briefs on to the um, advisors to the president. And I think that's really critical. So I'm posing a challenge to each and everyone. I want to urge us to continue the conversations that we're having this morning in your own circles, because that will multiply the effect of our conversation today. Um, it's really critical that we all take what we've learned this morning and take it back to our own environments to digest what's in the briefs, to read what's in it, to ask the critical questions of those in your sphere of influence that you can be asking of. But most importantly, what has been highlighted this morning is to put children's rights on the agenda and to make and to put this as a really important place for children, that that we have to include children as the centre of all our decisions. So I wish you all well for the rest of the day and hoping that we will continue conversations in whatever form we can following on from this. And thank you all for joining us this morning. And also a big thank you to those who are sitting out um, uh, in the audience and for your contribution in terms of your chats and we're hoping that we can continue some of those conversations with you in the next coming days. Thank you. Thank you Shanaz. thank you everybody. Uh, it's midday, we're exactly on time and great work and let's uh, make this real for children's lives and rights. Thank you. <laughs>